On October 18, 1924, Red Grange of the Fighting Illini had one of the finest games for a running back in college football history, and this came against the heavily favored and vaunted Michigan defense. This is the same day that made this week's hero famous, and ultimately led to him becoming the first commissioner of the NFL. And it all started with a nickname from a Grantland Rice article that captivated a nation. And that nickname was the Four Horsemen. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step up for DeLorean, the date is May 4th, 1903, and we are in Davenport, Iowa. We're here to witness the birth of this week's hero. This week's hero's name is Elmer Francis Layden who would end up becoming the first commissioner of the NFL. And this would be at a time when leadership was greatly needed. But let's take a step back from this whole commissioner talk. Let's hop in the DeLorean. Let's go way back in time and let's go ahead and figure out what made Elmer Francis Layden into the man that he became to become the first commissioner of the NFL. I mean, of course, he grew up playing football, which obviously that's kind of a theme on this show. In high school, he was a fullback that was a legendary status in the state of Iowa. Then he would enter Notre Dame in 1921. And as a freshman, he shared the duty as quarterback with Harry Stodraher. Then by the junior year, he was given fullback duties on one of the most famous backfields in all of American football history. Together with Jim Crowley, Don Miller, and Harry Stodraher himself, they would form an unstoppable force of mayhem all over the field. They were called the Four Horsemen. A name coined by Grantland Rice, the most famous sports writer from the early 20th century. Now, I'm telling you what, they just don't make him like him anymore. He wrote of myths and legends in sports known as the Golden Age of Sports back in the 20s. Remember that line about Red Grange calling him the Galloping Ghost? Yup. I tell you what, that game also as we found out in the introduction, was on October 18th, 1924. And it was the inspiration for that poem. It also happened to be the same day that would be the inspiration for what would ultimately become The Four Horsemen. And even though this podcast episode is not about Grantland Rice, I'm going to say that in this day, Grantland Rice changed the way people would look at football forevermore. Easily. One of the most important dates in sports writing history. And you can learn more about that famous Red Grange game leading to him becoming the Galloping Ghost over on episode 5. I'll leave a link in the show notes for you. And by the way, you can get to the show notes by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes well each and every week. But let's get back to episode 5. That talked about one of the most important individual performances in college football history. Again, same day. But this other important performance, this was not an individual performance. This was a fearsome foursome, and they were known as the Four Horsemen. Here's the line from the article. And yes, again, like I said, this is Grantlin Rice, and the line goes as such. Outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. In dramatic lore, they were known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. These are only aliases. Their real names are Stroderher, Miller, Crowley, and Layden. They formed the crest of the South Bend Cyclone before which another fighting army team swept over the precipice of polo grounds this afternoon. Now, talk about painting a picture of legendary status. Think about this. Many of these people that were either reading this newspaper or even hearing somebody tell them of this, they were not able to even watch TV. There wasn't really TV going on, especially not broadcasting football, that is, because we learned about that later. They had to oftentimes rely on writers such as Grantland Rice to give them an understanding of how it was on the gridiron. And he did such a good job of painting a picture of 
glorious battle that he would give you goosebumps and chills just making you want to go watch a game because if you haven't seen a football game previously then articles like this and the one about red grange definitely made you want to go gets you to want to go watch those football games bam boom the rest will be history and it started the path of football taking over the nation I mean, there was even a picture of the four horsemen wearing their football gear with footballs in hand on top of horses and just saying, hey, I am part of this four horsemen legendary status and you aren't going to stop me. I mean, I'm just telling you what, dudes, different times. But it makes me wonder, how much did newspaper and writers like Grantland Rice have to do with the rise and dominance of football in America? I'm thinking a Grantland Rice episode may be in order and it might be a good idea. What do you think? If you do, give me a shout. I'd love to hear about it. You can head to the contact page on the Foot by History Dude. But let's get back to Layden himself. Elmer Layden, part of the Four Horsemen. 1924, this was his senior year. And again, he was the fullback, mind you. He was the heaviest of the Four Horsemen at a whopping 162 pounds. How about that? 162 pounds. I mean, that's probably my right leg. That's maybe my left one. I don't know. I mean, is there anybody in the NFL that's that size anymore? Maybe the kicker, the water boy, uh, someone around that. I mean, I saw it. I had to look it up. And there's some little dudes recently, 150 pounds for this one guy. Let's just say, you're not going to make it in the league that long, son. But he was the heaviest of the vaunted four horsemen, the legendary group that struck fear in opposing defenses. Again, different times. Different style of players who had to play both ways. Not just specialized in offense or defense or what have you. They had to play on both sides of the ball. But regarding his offensive prowess, this is what legendary coach Newt Rockney had to say to sum up his running ability. He developed a straight line dive that made him one of the most unusual fullbacks in football. But I'll tell you what, the culmination of his college career was the 1925 Rose Bowl. A game against Stanford. Across the country, across the nation. Of course, these Stanford fans, they heard of the offensive firepower of Notre Dame, and I bet you the Stanford players were just getting a little bit nervous. Just a little bit skin nervous, because you got to deal with the four horsemen. But I'll tell you what, on that day, it was not necessarily the four horsemen that would ride again. Even though they would have an okay day. It was, however, the defense. That would stuff Stanford back into their holes, trouncing them 27 to 10 en route to Notre Dame's first undisputed national championship. So Elmer Layden, he played a big role, just a pretty big, huge role of what it was, because it's 27 to 10. Let's just say he scored three touchdowns. The first came on a three yard plunge into the end zone, which you would expect from a fullback from the Four Horsemen. But his other two scores, the two touchdowns that were even more impressive, He intercepted two balls and returned them for touchdowns. One was for 60 yards and another for 78. So a team and a forceful four horsemen known as a team for offense won with their defense. But it was not a total surprise that Layden had these interceptions because Elmer Layden, even though he was part of the four horsemen, he led the team in interceptions that year. And overall in his Notre Dame varsity career, they would accrue a 27-2-1 record. I'd say that's not too bad, only having a couple of losses and dealing with one of those daggone ties by having all those victories. And I would say this is one reason why he ultimately would end up becoming the first commissioner of the NFL, because he had all that success and fame and notoriety, which ended up leading down the path of where he would go next. Which, speaking of next, let's shift to his pro career. He didn't play a whole lot of years. He played pro ball for a couple years. And I saw in various sources that he was listed for playing with three different teams, even though it wasn't a whole lot really that much. He played, it said, for the Brooklyn Horsemen, which later that year would fold and be merged with the Brooklyn Lions. And I kind of was wondering how much of it had to do with being called the Brooklyn Horsemen because they had two of the four horsemen on the team. You know, other teams they discussed that he played for were the Rock Island Independents and the Hartford Blues. A game that continually was brought up was the 1925 season 
there was a game between Hartford Blues and the Cleveland Bulldogs. This time, all four horsemen would ride again for the Hartford Blues. What was kind of crazy, though, is they didn't really have that great of a game because they had a One of those weird deals where you'd play on Saturday, then bounce back, travel across a little bit, and play on Sunday, and you just didn't have a whole lot of rest. But it wasn't the same back then. They didn't have the set schedules and everything. They're just hoping that people show up to the stands. And ultimately, he did have a short-lived pro career at a time when professional football, let's just say it was on the back burner, baby. But he would help later in life save that back burner and maybe bring it up forward a little bit. But after his playing days, he did have to go into another role. He went into coaching because it didn't hurt that legendary coach Newt Rockney was his mentor. So let's just say it was fitting. His first two years as a head coach was at Columbia College, where he would amass an 8-5-2 record. Then for the next seven years, he would be the coach at Duquesne University with a 48-16-6 record. During this time, he starred in a movie. It was a 1931 movie that was titled The Spirit of Notre Dame, and all four horsemen were in this movie, so I think it was pretty cool. Later, he was on The Ed Sullivan Show, and also a TV series called We the People, where he played himself, a Notre Dame football player. Then, in 1934, his alma mater, Notre Dame, would come back and knock it, because in 1933, they had a season. That was horrible for a record of three wins, five losses, and one tie, which was the worst in school history. And this wasn't really that far removed from when the legendary Newt Rockney had the teams, the great teams of the 20s, and Hunk Anderson was the coach. Jesse Harper was the athletic director. Let's just say that the article I saw said that they, quote, I'm using air quotes here, resigned. But yeah, I believe they were fired. I mean, come on, 3-5-1, and one, your worst record, and they're used to having Newt Rockney and these legendary teams of the 20s? Well, let's just say, regardless of what the designation was, they're out the door. See you later, man. Don't let it hit you. Elmer Layden was hired to fill both of these roles for his alma mater. He had a much better success rate, let's just say. He ultimately had a 47-13-3 and three record. He turned that Notre Dame program around and he saved it. And a sidebar, something that I thought was also pretty cool, nothing really to do with football, but Elmer Layden had a game. There was a board game called Elmer Layden Scientific Football Board Game back in 1936. I'm like, a board game? I'm doing this research on this dude. I'm like, board game? Are you serious? How cool is that? I mean, sure, being in movies are awesome, but having your own board game after you, that's, that's the cat's meow, man. And he accomplished that, but so much more at the collegiate level as a player and a coach. Guess what? You know it. The NFL put him on notice. They would end up plucking him away from his alma mater to become the first ever NFL commissioner. Giving him sweeping powers because the NFL decided that they were going to elect a supreme authority. Amr Layden? Yeah, sure. He seemed like a good fit. So he was officially named the first commissioner, on March 1st, 1941. The league office would be moved to Chicago, and then basically Layden, here you go, dude, good luck, even though they didn't know it at the time, you're going to deal with trying to make the NFL survive during the World War II years, which was a tough time in America, and it was a tough time for the NFL. Almost having to shut the doors down. We talked about this a few episodes ago with Matthew Algeo, about how the Steagles and the green light letter from President Roosevelt. Elmer Layden had to make that decision, though. Even though the green light letter was technically given to Major League Baseball, Elmer Layden decided that, yes, we will keep pressing forward with the NFL. He also helped urge the Steelers and the Eagles to kind of like, hey, guys, I got no players. Let's how about you join forces and let's help save the league because rosters are dwindling from the war. So the league under Layden he would also end up getting some more rules that would revolutionize how we know and love and expect and respect the game today. In 1943, under Layden, the league would make mandatory for the first time, dude, you gotta put something over that cranium, you got to wear a helmet. Also, he would allow free substitution, 
which means that you can actually go back and forth in the plays. You don't have to be on the field the whole time. This is Greek to me. I don't understand it. But that would lead to now what we see as player safety and specialized rules for players, which allow them to create a more exciting, impactful game. Then World War II ended in 1945. The NFL players, they were back, well, the majority of them. And bottom line, Elmer Layden, well, he did his job because he got the NFL, being the first commissioner with sweeping powers, he got them through World War II. His contract, though, was initially scheduled for five years. And according to a New York Times article, he dropped a bombshell in January of 1946 at a league meeting, suddenly saying, I'm out. I'm done. I'm resigned. Supposedly, they, uh, you know, gave him a little bit of a contract offer to stick around for a little bit as an advisor for an indefinite period. They were going to give him the same salary, even. But he turned that down because he said that he had accepted a position as president of the Shippers Car Line Corporation in New York. This would lead to something that we have been talking about, uh, maybe not extensively, but quite a bit in the last previous episodes. On January 11th, 1946, Elmer Layden would officially be replaced by Burt Bell as the commissioner of the NFL. and We've been dubbing him the first great commissioner, but that's not to take anything away from Elmer Layden. You know, he was one-fourth the four horsemen, man. And like I said, he was the first commissioner of the NFL. He helped hold the league together during the Second Great War. So even though maybe he wasn't there for a long time, he still had a very huge impact on how the game is played, the way that you and I see it now. And here's a clip from the New York Times when he passed away describing his leadership style. Yet in spite of the high voltage that drove him in a worrying disposition that caused him to lose considerable weight during football campaigns, Mr. Layden was rarely known to lose his temper. To players and acquaintances, he was always calm and courteous. In his coaching, he chose reason rather than sentiment to stir teams. But while you chew on that one, let's just go back. Because this whole thing makes me think about maybe this is the exact type of leader the NFL needed during the years of the Second Great War. He was calm, courteous, during a tumultuous time for the nation. And if tempers would flare in a meeting or anywhere else deciding the fate of the league, who knows what could have happened. We've talked in recent episodes how the NFL was faced with serious questions, shutting down the doors or keeping them open. It was also thought possible if the NFL had shut the doors, it would never have opened again. If that's truly the case, then it's very possible Emmer Layden one of the four horsemen is highly responsible for saving the NFL. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the first commissioner in NFL history. Next week, we're going to have another guest on the show. His name is Clayton Truder, and he's going to stop by to help us type in some digits into that DeLorean by giving us an overview of some of the more essential books about NFL history. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs>